This video lecture is going to be on Plato's Carmides, a dialogue seemingly about the question, what is temperance, but is actually a dialogue about not only temperance, but virtue, knowledge, and philosophy uh, in general. Now, this dialogue is uh, one of Plato's most uh, homoerotic dialogues in that there is a really kind of skillful way in which Plato writes, um, where Socrates is attracted to Carmides. Uh, Socrates kind of makes um, a few comments in a way where uh, it's not sexually explicit except perhaps one moment, but where there's a kind of a, a double entendre, right? Like a, 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 a second way in which what he means can be understood. Like, for example, uh, he talks about how um, they're going to have to uh, unclothe, uh, uh, to take off uh, Carmides' robe to see uh, how beautiful his soul really is, right? Uh, or, you know, they're going to have to undress him to see whether his soul is really as beautiful as it appears to be. Um, so, of course, it, Socrates is attracted to Carmides, so there's a sense of, oh, you know, we should take off the robe, see how beautiful you really are. Um, but actually, uh, it, it's very important to understand uh, the role of beauty in philosophy. And there's a very serious way in which uh, the attraction that one can have to someone or something or attraction in general is something that is part of philosophical uh, inquiry. Now, I think we first had to get out uh, of the way the question of what is pederasty, right? Pederasty was this ancient Greek practice whereby um, young boys would uh, be courted by older men and basically the deal was, you know, you kind of uh, please, please me sexually and then the older man, you know, uh, in turn uh, helps to educate the younger boy until they first have uh, or, or until they begin to develop their first pubic hairs and then that's supposed to stop. It was this whole practice in ancient Greece um, and this is kind of the setting of, of a little bit what's going on here, why, you know, uh, 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 it's not weird for Socrates to have this uh, interest in Carmides because um, this kind of homosexuality was, uh, um, you know, not not uncommon back then. Now, um, I mention the role of um, a beauty in philosophy because it is first. Uh, the thing that humans rely most on oftentimes is our, our eyesight, right? We become interested in things, kind of like um, a bug becomes interested in light, right? Like, oh, what is that over there, you know? And there's a way in which the physical world can lead us into an, a, a deeper inquiry, right? Now, the trick is to not get caught up in the physical appearance of the world or the physical appearance of the thing you're inquiring into, but it is to understand the way in which that, that initial attraction that attraction itself can be useful to go beyond the attraction to that original thing you were interested in. And this is what happens uh, in this dialogue. This kind of original attraction to Carmides leads to a deeper inquiry into the potential um, temperance that Carmides um, uh, possesses. And this way in which um, one should not get caught up in the physical appearance of things um, and, and think that the, the, the physical appearance of things really, um, you know, it's like if you see someone that appears to be like a good person, does that mean they really are a good person just because they appear that way? And of course, a philosophical response would be, well, no, we need to look and see what are the characteristics, you know, we might associate with a good person and whether they um, truly are good, not whether just they appear good to all of us. And there's this uh, similar notion that's mentioned at the beginning of the dialogue um, about treating the entire body when it is just the eyes that have a problem. Now, they're interested in, uh, again, temperance. The question, what is temperance, uh, is what the dialogue is um, kind of centered around. That, that At least the appearance of the dialogue is centered around that question. Again, we should read beyond, though, that appearance. 
But the Greek word that, of, of temperance is sophrosune. Uh, it can also be translated perhaps as moderation, but this translation um, uh, it, it treats it as temperance. So Socrates says that the nature of uh, temperance, he says this to Carmides, is not such as to be able to cure the head alone. You have probably heard this about good doctors, that if you go to them with a pain in the eyes, they are likely to say that they cannot undertake to cure the eyes by themselves, but that it will be necessary to treat the head at the same time if things are to go well with the eyes. And again, it would be very foolish to suppose that one could ever treat the head by itself without treating the whole body. In keeping with this principle, they plan a regime for the whole body with the idea of treating and curing the part along with the whole. So Socrates likens this practice in ancient Greek medicine of uh, if there's a problem with your eyes or another part of the body, you have to treat the entire body as a whole because they're all related to one another. We should think about this when uh, um, uh, uh, questioning temperance. When thinking about what is temperance, how might temperance be related to the other virtues? How might virtue be related to knowledge and so on? Now, Socrates mentions that people often mistake um, thinking of a virtue being used for a specific end, and, and they often then want to have knowledge of a virtue just so they can be good at something. Often, right, the idea is um, you treat virtue as a, um, a means to an end, and usually the end you think is like making money, becoming famous, or something like that. Socrates says, don't let anyone persuade you to treat his head with this remedy who does not first submit his soul to you for treatment with the charm. Because nowadays, Zalmox has said, this is the mistake some doctors make with their patients. They try to produce health of the body apart from health of the soul. So there's this uh, clear relation Socrates wants to point out between if you're a really good person, it's not just uh, whether you wear nice clothes or whether you present yourself well, but how well on the inside you actually are, how well uh, your heart is, your mind is, your soul, um, and so on, right? It's to go beyond the mere appearance of things. In light of this, Socrates asks Carmides, are you sufficient in temperance or are you lacking in it? Do you possess the virtue of being um, temperate? Now, Carmides has a really interesting and clever response. Carmody says, if I should deny that I am temperate, it would not only seem an odd thing to say about oneself, and I, I should have said, uh, because Critias claims Carmody's is temperate. So Socrates asked Carmody's if this is true, right? So Carmody says, look, if I should say, no, I'm not temperate, then that would seem an odd thing to say about oneself because I would then make Critias look like a liar. And so, with many others, um, who by Critias' same account appear to be temperate. But if, on the other hand, uh, Carmody should agree and say, Why, well, yes, I am temperate. I do possess the virtue of temperance. He says, perhaps this would appear distasteful, right? It's like the person saying, um, I'm the most humble person in the world, right? It's like, well, if you are really humble, would you go around bragging about how humble you are? So Carmody says, I do not know what to answer. And in this, this of course, uh, makes Socrates realize this is the perfect time then to uh, mount an investigation into whether or not, uh, not only whether Carmody's is temperate or not, but what is temperance so we can know whether Carmody's is actually possessing this virtue or not. Now, the... Uh, method of investigation that Socrates employs is known as the Elenchus. So this is a kind of um, method of, of, of uh, idea elimination, uh, typically through a cross-examination, where Socrates uh, asks questions. Um, he does not lecture uh, uh, in order to, to, to say what the truth is, but he questions someone else to try and draw the truth uh, out of them. And so this begins with the assumption that um, uh, instead of, you know, one educating by kind of filling knowledge into the head of, of, of the, the student, one is actually drawing the truth out of uh, the student. So we usually write a question is asked, um, what is temperance? It could be, uh, what is justice? 
what is knowledge, uh, and so on. Now, what happens is when someone says, well, I think knowledge is X, Socrates questions it. And he just asks questions like, okay, uh, you say knowledge is X. Uh, can you explain this one thing? And they explain it. And he says, okay, on the basis of that assumption, how do you explain this other thing? Well, they try and go into rationalize, right, every explanation about that original definition X that they gave. And Socrates ends up finding, well, hold on, there's a contradiction that you say, where one of your explanations ends up contradicting an earlier explanation. And so that person probably says, well, okay, okay, maybe that was the wrong definition. They say, well, actually, um, the answer to your question is that uh, the definition of, of this thing is Y, right? So they give a different definition. And same thing happens, then they offer perhaps definition Z, same thing happens, and the dialogue ends up arriving at an impasse where they, they can't go on any longer, um, typically because the other person in the conversation grows tired of these questions from Socrates. Um, but they're just, uh, they enter an impasse, or, or in the Greek, an aporia. It's important to note, though, that every time a new definition is offered, uh, this does not mean that everything was disregarded from the previous definition. Things are learned from that definition, right? Things that help shape dialectically uh, the new definition that is proposed. And this then, because the conversation ends in, in, in aporia, this does not mean nothing was learned, but it does mean uh, we often uh, have to go back and look and piece things together. And, and this is the beauty of Platonic dialogues, right? It is not a lecture. It is not telling you what the truth is. It is actually an active engagement where the reader oftentimes has to see, hold on, why did someone have this response in, in uh, uh, to Socrates' question? Perhaps maybe there was... Um, Something about that Socrates said that meant to get that response out of the person. Should there have been a different response? Um, uh, what can we piece together from having this uh, perspective as a reader of the dialogue and therefore still a kind of participator in continuing this dialogue among ourselves? But what can we do piecing all that information together to go beyond the dialogue, right? So just because it ends in operia does not mean... Uh, the, the dialogue is finished. It's always taken up uh, when we continue reading and engaging with the dialogue. Okay, so Carmides uh, proposes his first definition of temperance, and he says, temperance is doing everything in an orderly and quiet way. So temperance is a sort of quietness. And this is a probably pretty common assumption of what temperance is, right? We think of temperance or moderation, a kind of... Um, uh, someone is not, not too much, but kind of reserved, maybe, right? Now, Socrates asks this question, though, right? He says, well, what is more admirable in, let's say, writing? Is it doing writing quickly or quietly? And then he says the same for reading, playing music, wrestling, boxing, running, jumping, and so on. And it's admitted by Carmides, well, I mean, in writing, it's better that someone... Uh, if they're, you know, transcribing things, writes quickly as opposed to quietly. It doesn't seem how writing quietly uh, is admirable. Same thing with running quickly or quietly. Well, running is more admirable uh, doing it quickly than, again, quietly. Same thing with boxing and so on. So Socrates says, well, it seems to us that in matters of the body, at least, it's not the quieter movement, but the quickest and most lively, which is the most admirable. Right, so what he's saying is, you know, if we think about this virtue in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, a virtue of, of uh, um, character, uh, uh, of action, we might say, uh, then clearly doing these things quietly, right, uh, um, isn't something praiseworthy. And the assumption is, virtue is praiseworthy. It is admirable to possess it. So temperance uh, uh, for the body's quickness, according to this account, not quietness. And they end up arguing, well, the same is true for learning for the soul, because, again, of uh, uh, the same thing with reading and so on. And, and, and learning as well, right? Someone learns, uh, uh, we, we would say it's more admirable for someone to learn quickly, uh, quick, uh, quickly as opposed to learning quietly. Um, again, it's not clear why learning quietly would be admirable. So it's declared that temperance cannot be a kind of quietness. As Socrates says, we conclude that temperance would not be a kind of quietness, nor would the temperate life be quiet. 
as far as this argument is concerned at any rate, since the temperate life is necessarily an admirable thing. And it was determined that doing all these things quietly isn't necessarily admirable. So temperance cannot be a sort of quietness. Carmides offers a second definition. Temperance makes people ashamed and bashful, and so it must be modesty. Now there's an obvious problem, and I, I guess it makes sense why, again, Carmides would say uh, temperance makes people ashamed and bashful, because what Socrates wants to do in, in a certain way here uh, is he's, he's getting these assumptions out of Carmides that are the assumptions that society has, and that Carmides has... Uh, internalized, right? This idea that, uh, oh, it's not valiant to be uh, temperate, right? And so temperate people are ashamed, they're bashful, and so on, right? Now, the first uh, obviously uh, obvious thing about why this can't be the case is that, well, it's assumed again, all virtues are admirable and good things, and modesty, uh, the way it's being described, is not a good thing, um, at least as Socrates quotes Homer, and he says that Homer says that modesty is not a good mate for a needy man. And he says, don't you agree with this, Carmides? And Carmides says, well, yes, of course, this was Homer. Homer must have known what he was talking about. So they conclude that, well, temperance then cannot be uh, modesty insofar as it makes people ashamed and bashful. And I think this is a, a good place to, to uh, ask these questions that we should be asking every time a definition and response is uh, made. Is Homer right? Right? Was this a test that Carmides failed? Was this meant to lead Carmides elsewhere, this question that was asked, uh, by saying, well, don't you agree with Homer? By using his own dispositions against him. Because often, uh, Socrates ends up criticizing poets and especially Homer. So why then would he say, well, hey, look, Homer says this. Don't you agree with Homer? Perhaps it was meant to see a test for Carmides. Carmides seems to perhaps fail the test. But what about you as the reader? Do you agree? Well, Homer says this, so it must be true. What if there was someone else, right? Barack Obama says this, the president, so it must be true. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, so it must be true. Um, Donald Trump said this, so it must be true, right? Whatever else, right? Whoever uh, uh, someone looks up to, do you believe it just because someone said the thing is true? Right? And later in philosophy, that will become um, known as a fallacy. Um, some Different names sometimes might appeal to uh, um, uh, uh, authority. Now, a third definition is offered by Carmides. Temperance as minding one's own business. And this is really interesting because uh, in Plato's uh, Republic, this is actually uh, offered as um, the final account of justice that they deal with, that justice is uh, minding one's own business. So it's very interesting here that this is applied to temperance. And just something to think about if reading the other dialogue, the Republican, how could this be? And, and, you know, why would this be used in both cases? And we should also think about the uh, critique of this account, um, which we'll get to in a moment. But so Socrates points out that writing about society, let's say if one was like a journalist or uh, whatever else, uh, um, uh, being involved in medicine, house building, weaving, and the arts in general involves the interests of others. So all the things we might want to say you know, because we can apply virtues uh, to all these different tasks. We can talk about, you know, virtues regarding different tasks. Would we say then that um, a temperate, and remember temperate is supposed to be good because it's a virtue, a house builder who is temperate um, uh, does not, you know, minds one's own business. Or someone who's involved in medicine minds one's own business. Or a journalist minds one's own business, right? Doesn't get involved in the interests of others. Well, that's actually not what all these different professions do. They are interested in others, especially, obviously, journalists involved with investigating affairs, usually of the powerful, holding them to account. Medicine as well, investigating people's bodies, seeing whether they're healthy or not. And it's pointed out that if a city 
for example, so we want to talk about the art of politics, if a city is to be temperately governed and so governed well, it couldn't mind its own business. What kind of a, uh, a of, of a leader isn't mind uh, isn't interested in the actions of uh, its citizens, right? Socrates says, well then, do you think a city would be well governed by a law commanding each man to weave and wash his own cloak, make his own shoes and oil flask and scraper, perform everything else by the same principle of keeping his hands off of other people's things and making and doing his own? And the obvious answer is no. So it's not clear then how temperance could be a matter of minding one's own business. At this point, Critias uh, uh, jumps into the dialogue here and tries to, in a way, rescue Charmides. And what Critias does is he says, well, look, I think um, sticking with that third definition that uh, temperance is a matter of uh, minding one's own business, Critias says, you know, I think I can maybe restate what is meant by minding one's own business. And that when one minds its, their own business, they focus on the task at hand, they uh, make things. So temperance is the doing of good things or the making of them. And one way we can think about this is temperance is an application of the good, right? The moral good, that, that value, the good, which determines all things, which determines the value of all things, whether we praise things or blame things. Now they're on to something here, of course, right? Because we should think about virtue as perhaps uh, an application of the good, right? That one who is virtuous actually brings out into the world actions of the good. But it's the way in which this is phrased we have to look at specifically, right? That temperance is the doing of good things or the making of them. <clears throat> Socrates says, if Critias is correct, then temperance ends up turning into a matter of consequence. It ends up being external to the individual as opposed to a virtue possessed by the individual which then is still concerned with other people's business. So that would end up um, uh, contradicting uh, the reformulation then of the claim that uh, temperance is a matter of minding one's own business. Uh, but I want to read this passage uh, in the dialogue here. So Socrates says, didn't you say just a moment ago that there was nothing to prevent craftsmen, even while they do other people's business, from being temperate? Yes, I did say that, Critias said, but what about it? Nothing, but tell me if you think that a doctor, when he makes someone healthy, does something useful both for himself and for the person he cures. Yes, I agree, Critias says. And the man who does these things does what he ought. Yes, says Crit Critias. And the man who does what he ought is temperate, isn't he? Of course he's temperate, Critias says. And does a doctor have to know when he cures in a useful way and when he does not? And so with each of the craftsmen, does he have to know when he's going to benefit from the work he performs and when he is not? Perhaps not, Critias says. Then sometimes, I said, the doctor doesn't know himself whether he has acted beneficially or harmfully. Now, if he has acted beneficially, then according to your argument, he has acted temperately. Or isn't this what you said? Yes, it is, Critias says. So if... Um, temperance is a matter of doing good things or, or making good things. Well, we often know, right, th with, with the professions he just mentioned, we often know whether or not the thing is good according to uh, how it can be used, right? So let's say you're a carpenter. You want to know, can it be used as a chair? Well, you have to look at the actual uh, 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 external account of these things, right? You have to look at the consequence of your action, of the making, the consequence that you bring out in the world. And if that's the case, then the consequence uh, is matters uh, to other people, which means virtue, at least in terms of temperance, would not be something that the individual uh, has control of. And that would be a very weird thing to speak of someone that is virtuous, yet they're not in control of whether they're virtuous or not because it's all a matter of consequence and the consequence is ultimately out of their hand. So there's a way here where there's a kind of um, uh, a putting into check that yes, to some extent, right? Definitely. 
uh, 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 the, the consequence of actions is relevant to virtue, but we don't say, right, according to virtue ethics, whether something is good or bad solely in terms of it, the consequence it brings about in the world. It's a, a matter of being, a way of uh, being in the world. Now, because there was that issue with um, uh, the fact that one would not be in control of the virtue themselves, Critias reformulates that third definition once more, and this is the final one that we get. He says, temperance is knowing oneself. This is really important because this is basically what the Delphic inscription says. Know thyself. This is something that Socrates talked about. Knowing oneself. So there's a way then when every time a new definition is proposed, some aspect of that definition, the previous definition is left behind, yet an aspect is also kept and continued forward. So we learned from the previous one. Okay, consequence is relevant, but whether temperance uh, is a good or bad thing is not dependent solely on the consequence. One, to be temperate, has to know themselves. And of course, the question is, what does it mean to know oneself? This, I think, is where we really begin to see um, what Plato did that was so revolutionary in uh, the history of Western philosophy. Basically, the pre-Socratics had been concerned with philosophy as beginning from abstract contemplation. And then, right, maybe you could then go to uh, practical applications. But Plato, in the dialogues we can see, in this case, for example, does not begin with abstract complication, but he begins with the concern for how to live the good life. That we begin with the question, what is temperance, wanting to know whether Carmides was temperate or not, wanting to know what this means to be temperate, and this leads us to abstract uh, contemplation, but beginning from the question of the good life, beginning from ethics, and ultimately returning to ethics. And we can see here, I think, uh, through the rest of this dialogue, uh, the connection between ethics and epistemology, and why we can't merely talk about ethics. We can't merely talk about virtue, right? Because virtue is connected to, uh, um, well, wisdom is a virtue, but wisdom is connected to knowledge. Understanding what it means to be virtuous is connected to, well, how do you know whether you can know uh, uh, what uh, virtue is or not, right? All these things are connected, metaphysics, epistemology, and so on. Some issues we should think about through the rest of this dialogue. Is temperance a virtue separate from the other virtues? Now, obviously, it is a, a, a virtue separate in the sense that we can talk about being courageous, we can talk about being wise, we can talk about um, uh, uh, being honest, and so on. But the question is, is it so separate that you can talk about um, uh, temperance without needing to know any of the other virtues? And not even whether you need to know, but whether one can act Right? Can one be temperate but not be courageous? Or can one be temperate but not be wise? Right? Can one lack all the other virtues? Or do they all go together because it's all connected? That one application of the good, if temperance is an application of the good, means one has to know what the good is such that they would always act out the good. They would always be virtuous in all the virtues. Must one possess knowledge of virtue before being virtuous? Must Carmides know what virtue is, what temperance is, and whether he's temperate before he can be temperate? Or is it the case that Carmides can be temperate but not know that he's temperate? Finally, I think the last question we should think about, does knowledge of virtue, or just knowledge of temperance specifically, make one virtuous or temperate? So this question here, what does it mean to know oneself, right? That's the question. If we can figure out whether um, 
we can give a rational account of what it means to know oneself, then perhaps we can know whether or not that can be uh, the definition of temperance or not. And then we can, of course, apply that to Carmenes and see, does Carmenes meet this definition? Now, they come to this uh, account that temperance is the only science, and we don't want to think about, obviously, modern science, but just science as, as a, uh, a matter of uh, a rational inquiry. Is uh, uh, they they made this claim that temperance is the only science if it is if if to be temperate is to know thyself that temperance is the only science that is both a science of itself and of the other sciences that it is the only rational investigation of a rational investigation of rational investigation and of other kinds of rational investigations. Socrates says. Then only the temperate man will know himself and will be able to examine what he knows and does not know. And in the same way, he will be able to inspect other people to see when a man does in fact know what he knows and thinks he knows. And when again, he does not know what he thinks he knows and no one else will be able to do this. And being temperate and temperance and knowing oneself amount to this, to knowing what one knows and does not know. That to know thyself, would involve being able to know what it means to know oneself. So temperance is a matter of knowing oneself. And it's a matter of knowing, right? It, it is that, that process of being able to investigate, do I know what it means to know myself such that I can know myself? It also means being able to know whether someone else knows themselves or not, whether they are temperate or not. And whether someone else possesses the other virtues as well, because this is kind of investigation into does one know kind of the, um, uh, uh, can one almost, we might think of, give an account of what it is that they do, right? So if one is a master carpenter, can they give a, an account of, 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 of what carpentry is, what is involved in that task? And what does that mean? Does it mean being able to teach it? Does it mean being able to explain the physics of that task? Right? These are some questions to think about. Is it possible for there to be a science of science itself, of other sciences, and then the absence of science altogether? Because not only then is if temperance is the only science that is both a science of itself and of the other sciences, then temperance would know when there is the absence of temperance. Socrates says, that it would be whether no existing thing can by nature apply its own faculty to itself, but only towards something else, or whether some can, but others cannot. Whether, if there are things that apply to themselves, the science which we call temperance is among them. I think one way to think about this is, there is no science of science that goes beyond science. Now, there is a science of, of science, perhaps, and that one could do an empirical investigation of the methods of science. But there is not an investigation which goes beyond the presuppositions of that investigation, right? So there's a kind of presupposition that uh, um, material exists in the world and that uh, the best way to um, learn about the material in that world is through the scientific, uh, using the scientific method, through empir empirical observation. That has to be granted, right? Taken as given, as obvious. That can never be questioned by science itself because it has to use its own method, which takes that for granted. Is there something else, like perhaps philosophy, that actually is the only thing that can question itself? So uh, I'm going to read this passage here, uh, 167 C to E. Let's see. Okay. Socrates says, well, wouldn't the whole thing amount to this? If what you said just now is true, that there is one science which is not of anything except itself and the other sciences, and that this same science is also a science of the absence of science, then see what an odd thing we are attempting to say, my friend. Because if you look for this same thing in other cases, you will find, I think, that is impossible. Uh... Critias asks, you know, uh, how is that? In what cases do you mean? So Socrates says, cases like the following. Consider, for instance, 
If you think there could be a kind of vision that is not the vision of the thing that other visions are of, but is the vision of itself and the other visions and also of the lack of visions, and although it is a type of vision, it sees no color, only itself and the other visions. Do you think there is something of this kind? Good heavens, no, not I. And what about a kind of hearing that hears no sound, but hears itself and the other hearings and non-hearings? Not this either. Then take all the senses together and see if there is any one of them that is a sense of the senses and of itself, but that senses nothing which the other senses sense. I can't see that there is, says Critias. And do you think there is any desire that is a desire for no pleasure but for itself and the other desires? Certainly not, Critias says. Nor indeed any wish, I think, that wishes for no good, but only for itself and the other wishes. And so on, right? And so the idea is, look, all the other arts, if we think about uh, um, uh, carpentry, uh, fishing, boxing, etc. These are all interested in uh, actual things that are produced by the activity, right? And it is concerned with those objects. But here, what we're talking about, about this question of what it means to know thyself, is to know not about uh, the object produced by the art, but the art itself. What is the makeup of the art itself and whether one is good at that art or not. And so what we're talking about, for example, with this case, right? What about a kind of hearing that hears no sound but hears itself and the other hearings and non-hearings? So when we're talking about knowing oneself, we're not talking about an application of the good. We're talking about kind of um, metaphysical epistemic inquiry into the nature of that thing itself, right? That's separate from the application of that thing. So it would be an investigation into like, what is hearing? Now, it's not interested in what one he hears, right? So if I tap on, uh, that was a bad idea. I just I just spilled my coffee on my book. Um, so it wouldn't be the case. Let's use this one. Okay. So I tap on this, right? And I'm obviously hearing this. Um, now my, my, my ear, right? When I hear this, I'm hearing this tapping sound. But we're interested not in this sound, but in the process that's going on in my ear of hearing this tapping sound. The question is, right, this art or this science, right, of itself, the science of hearing that is only interested in hearing and in a way, right, and then it's interested in non-hearing, whether one can hear or not, not what one hears. So it's an interest and in perhaps the how or the process and not the what or the thing. This is something very different from what was being discussed previously about this idea of um, uh, temperance being a kind of a making of good things where it's an application. Now here we've kind of gone to the other extreme where we're now talking about a matter of uh, a, 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 a metaphysical inquiry, really. Okay. Now, if temperance is merely a science of science, then one will only know that one w knows, not what they know, right? If one is interested in, in uh, uh, hearing in this way, a kind of hearing of hearing, one will only be interested in whether thing, uh, things can be heard, not what can be heard. And this seems strange since one would only know whether someone was skilled in their own field or not, and not in others. There's also this question of how can you know what you don't hear, right? Or or, or how can you hear what you don't hear? Because you would have an, uh, uh, a mastery of uh, what it is to hear. So you can say when one is hearing and when one is not hearing. But how then, if you're not interested in the actual objects, the application of hearing, and only in the process of hearing, how could you know when this process is not going on? You would have to have knowledge of non-hearing or non-science in this case. right? And this is a question that gets taken up um, in uh, uh, the Theotetus, for example, uh, very similar to this question of uh, how can you have knowledge of a false belief of that which is not? So it's very similar here. Now, there is an apparent, and I say apparent because uh, 
Perhaps one might fall into this trap, but one should look beyond it. Uh, again, similarly through other things throughout the dialogue. Socrates says, well, there could be an upshot of this, that experts would be left to run the affairs they know best, ensuring everything is done with excellence or everything is done virtuously. Right? So if temperance is merely a science of science, that one only knows what they, they do know, that one only knows whether someone is skilled in their own field or not and not in other fields, then, for example, a scientist would stick to science and they wouldn't be interested in politics. Uh, an economist would stick to economics and wouldn't be interested in medicine. Uh, a doctor would, be, would stick to uh, judging others' abilities in medicine and not in, um, in dance and so on, right? And it seems that in that way, everyone sticks to exactly what they're an expert in. Everything then should flourish because everyone only does what they are the best at. Now, it's notable that, it, so this is, again, my, uh, taking up that idea of minding one's own business and seeing if you can work this out through this idea of knowing oneself. Now, this is interesting for at least one reason, which is, Socrates, is Socrates not a philosopher? Is Socrates not someone that's virtuous? That's not a good person? Um, because Socrates certainly did not mind their own business, right? This is what led to him getting killed. So what would that say about someone like Socrates? So I want to look at a passage here from uh, 171d. So then Critias, Socrates replied, what benefit would we get from temperance if it is of this nature? Because if, as we assumed in the beginning, the temperate man knew what he knew and what he did not know, and that he knows the former but not the latter, and were able to investigate another man who was in the same situation, then it would be of the greatest benefit to us to be temperate. Because those of us who had temperance would live lives free from error, and so would all those who were under our rule. Neither would we ourselves be attempting to do things we did not understand. Rather, we would find those who did understand and turn the matter over to them. Nor would we trust those over whom we ruled to do anything except what they would do correctly. And this would be that of which they possessed, the science. And thus, by means of temperance, every household would be well run, and every city well governed. And so in every case where temperance reigned, and with error rooted out and rightness in control, Men so circumstanced would necessarily fare admirably and well in all their doings and faring well, they would be happy. Isn't this what we mean about temperance, Critias, I said, when we say what a good thing it would be to know what one knows and what one does not know? Now, something to think about is... When Socrates says, if that were the case, we would look for those who are temperate and therefore skilled in, let's say, politics and put them in charge of running government. But here's the question. If temperance is only about knowing whether someone is skilled in that own, their own field or not that they're temperate in, like politics, then how would other people push for the people skilled in politics to become leaders? political leaders because they wouldn't know they wouldn't possess the temperance of politics to then know whether someone was skilled in politics or not and here we come back to this a uh, way in which all these aspects are interconnected that this kind of narrowing out and saying well temperance is just a uh, 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 where you let the experts do their own thing and none of the experts in, in interfere with other fields they aren't experts in. And everyone is left to their own task, performing it uh, uh, excellently. But the problem is, at least in politics in this case, no one would actually know who would be the best political leader besides political leaders. And no one would know to believe them that they were the best. Because, again, they don't have knowledge of it because they're not temperate in politics. So even in this case then, right, we don't know how can you go from this metaphysical account of this science of a science to the application then of the science of science, which should, if this is the application of a virtue, lead to good things. It's unclear how this is possible. 
So the dialogue ends in aporia. We're left wondering, how can one know that which they do not know? Right? Something Socrates uh, uh, famously said, the only thing I know is which I know nothing. What does that mean? How is that possible to know that you know nothing? We're also left thinking about the use value of temperance, right? It's unclear how to understand the connection between science that is purely of knowledge and science that is a techne. Techne is this Greek word for art, a uh, kind of uh, skill. So it's unclear how you have this kind of metaphysical knowledge with practical knowledge, or, or we might also think about this as um, a theory and action, right? How those two connect. Would perfect wisdom, which perhaps would be a knowledge of knowledge, right? A knowledge of what it means to know something really make someone happy. It's unclear about that as well, because we don't know what temperance is. If we don't know what temperance is, how can we know whether someone is temperate or not, and whether then we can see whether they're happy or not? Even a science of the good, or of a kind of moral advantage, does not have a clear connection to temperance as a science of sciences. That that uh, a kind of pure uh, practice of, uh, uh, of the good, of ethics, it's not clear how that has a connection to temperance as a science of science. So not only going from theory to practice, but then practice to theory. So I think the problem in general, I think we can sum, uh, summarize as this. In each case, there's an aspect of temperance as a knowledge of knowledge that is in excess of itself. That in each case, and thinking about what it means to be temperate, there's something that goes beyond it that one has to have knowledge of, which ends up leading one to seek knowledge of everything. It ends up leading one to study philosophy if, right, in the Greek, philo, a kind of loving friendship, sophia, wisdom, a love of wisdom, and as we uh, uh, see in Plato's dialogue, um, uh, the symposium, uh, this kind of uh, indefinite desire or pursuit of beauty. That wanting to know what temperance is and wanting to be temperance involves going beyond temperance. Looking into other fields as well that one would need to study. So perhaps one way to think about this is that philosophy is this science. Philosophy is this science of science. That a philosopher is one who attempts to know themselves. And that temperance as a virtue is related to the use value that's desired, this application of knowing oneself. And this is a great demonstration, I think, this dialogue of how Plato shows that this practical issue of just wanting to be a good person leads one to abstract contemplation, leads one to questions of knowledge, which takes one back to practical application and ethics uh, once again. And that is, I think, the, the beauty of this dialogue, that it really, uh, in a, a short, um, in a short uh, text, uh, really encapsulates a lot of uh, uh, philosophical questions.